journey, she thinks. This baby had overlooked the universe. These rags keeping him warm warm used to be the robes of eternity. His golden throne room had been abandoned in favor of a, in favor of a dirty sheep pen. And worshiping angels had been replaced with kind but bewildered shepherds. Meanwhile, the city hums. The merchants are unaware that God had visited their planet. The innkeeper would never believe that he had just sent God into the cold. And the people would scoff at anyone who told them the Messiah lay in the arms of a teenager on the outskirts of their village. They were all too busy to consider the possibility. Those who missed his majesty's arrival that night missed it not because of evil acts or malice, no. They missed it because they simply weren't looking. Little has changed in the last 2,000 years, has it? Please stay seated and enjoy. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters did you know that your baby boy is doomed to make you new and this child that you deliver will soon deliver you mary did you know that your baby boy would give sight to a blind man. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. Oh, Mary, did you know? your baby boy would one day rule the nation did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb and that sleeping child you're holding is the great Mary, 
heartache did you know? Hello, Grace. Let's stand together and continue our worship. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, just being, being just a man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. She, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us. Let's continue. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased.
after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hid their faces he was despised and we esteemed him not. 
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living? stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his, in his death. Although he had not done, as, although he has done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors.
Till that stone was moved for good Before the Lamb has conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church, and the church of Christ was born And then the Spirit lit the flame this gospel the truth of old shall not kneel, shall not fade. And by his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. We praise him, who oh, praise the Father. Jesus, we praise you. That is why we are here tonight. You are king and ki king of kings, and you are Lord of lords. We are here to declare that once again over our lives tonight. Jesus, we thank you for your coming. It is you we celebrate. We thank you for the joy of this season, but there would be no joy without your coming. So Jesus, all the glory, all the honor, all the praise of tonight, we lift to you. Thank you, Jesus. And it is in your precious name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Grace, you may have a seat. Welcome, everyone, tonight. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors here. If you are uh, new with us this evening, a special welcome to you. We are so glad you joined us tonight to celebrate our King. Uh, I, we are going to turn from a, a joy in worship through song to joy in worship through giving. And uh, later on, we will turn to uh, worship him in joy through his word. So would you bow your heads with me as we turn our uh, attention to giving? Lord God, we thank you that you gave. You gave because of your love for us, and your, because you gave, Lord, your giving motivates us to give in return. Not because you need it, but because you are worthy of it. So, Lord, we look to you as our provider. We thank you for all that you have provided in our lives. Every good thing is a gift from you. And so all the good things we have experienced so far tonight, all the good things we look to experience tomorrow with family and friends, we recognize that you are the giver of all of it. So tonight, right now, we take this moment to just give a small portion of your good gifts back to you. Lord, we, we ask that you would receive these gifts from the grateful hearts which offer them. We do this in worship to you, Lord. And God, we ask that you would use these gifts to grow your kingdom in this area and around the world, that others might come to know the joy and the life that is available only through you. We love you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we receive the offering tonight, I'm going to do something that we uh, do frequently at Grace. We point to the impact that you, that you have through giving to Grace. And there's many things I could point to tonight. By giving through Grace, you are part of feeding those who are hungry in this region through the harvest. Those who need clothes through the closet. Those who need fitness have the opportunity to get that through the Lord's gym. Those who need counseling have the opportunity through in him counseling. There's a lot of, a lot of things that you give to when you give to grace. But uh, tonight I want to point back to uh, some of the initiatives that we have every Christmas. A lot of you give to that as part of the family of grace. And you don't end up hearing some of the fruit of that. So I just want to point to some of the fruit of that tonight. One of the programs that we have during the Christmas season at Grace is called Christmas Blessings. 
And the intention of that program is to bless those who are part of our family here at Grace, families who are struggling to provide a Christmas for their families, struggling for whatever reason in that season. And Christmas blessings anonymously connects those who want to give to those who need to receive in this season. And so through that program, we have 21 families that have been blessed by that program. 21 families whose Christmas mornings tomorrow will look very different because they've been blessed by members of the family of grace. So yeah, let's give them a hand in that. We also, so many of you give towards Operation Christmas Child. That's where we pack boxes, shoe boxes, full of gifts for little kids. We send them across the world so a child can not just receive a gift, although they might never have received one before. But not just so that they could receive a Christmas gift, but even more than that, so that they have an opportunity to hear the gospel. And through them, their parents and their communities have an opportunity to hear the gospel. So through Grace, the Grace family this year, we sent out over 1,000 boxes through just the Grace family alone. We are also a receiving center for the community, and nearly 3,000 boxes went out from Grace Fellowship Church from this community uh, going out across the world as we speak. And last of all, I want to mention our angel tree program. That's where we put a bunch of tags on a tree that's out for several weeks in the lobby. You all pick up a tag and go buy that gift and bring it back. And all of those gifts bless New Life Home for women and children, for mothers and children in Glen Rock, Pennsylvania, one of our partner ministries. Uh, this year, we had our most successful uh, year with Angel Tree than ever before. That tree kept emptying, and we had to keep asking them for more tags so we could put it back and refill it. Uh, Rachel Stoll, the director of that ministry, sent a thank you note, and I just want to uh, read a portion of it tonight. She says this. She said, says, good afternoon, Grace Fellowship. I want to say a big thank you to all who graciously gave of their time, their resources, and their finances to give a family a Christmas here in our ministry. Not only this year, but in years prior, Grace has locked arms with us so that we are able to give every mother and every child gifts to open on Christmas morning. We know we celebrate the life of our Savior on Christmas morning, but something just as impactful is celebrating his love. It's his love for us that enabled him to endure the cross so that we might live. It's his love that compels us to give. We give because he first gave. Sound familiar? That's what we've been saying here for a lot of weeks. Grace Fellowship, you give in such a way that the Lord's life and light is seen on top of this mountain. You may not know the faces of those that have uh, you have impacted by your giving, but Jesus knows their name and knows their every need, and you have reflected the heart of the Father to them. We are seeing the glory of God in the lives of our precious moms and their little ones. We are truly seeing the power of God break chains of addiction right here in little old Glen Rock. We are blessed to see with our very own eyes lost souls being saved and set free. This is what it's about. People know him as Father. Because of your continued support, not just at Christmas, but all year long, we are able to provide a safe haven for these families to meet Jesus, heal, grow, and begin to walk in their new identities in him. So Grace Family, thank you for giving to all these initiatives because you have blessed far more than you know in that. Can we give Jesus a hand in the ways he's blessed so many? And now we are uh, going to turn our attention to worshiping God through his word. In preparation for our hearts to do that, I just want to invite uh, Dan and Susan Hendrickson to come forward with our Advent reading tonight. Good afternoon. God gave Christ. In lighting the Christ candle this afternoon, we celebrate and announce, as did a host of angels more than 2,000 years ago, the birth of Jesus, the gift of Christ, the one and only Son of God, so that whoever would believe in him would have eternal and abundant life. Like Mary, we ponder in our hearts the significance and meaning of the one chosen, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, Emmanuel, God with us. And like the shepherds and wise men, we have come to see and experience and know for ourselves that Jesus, who was born to us, is our Savior and lives within us. For us, this means forgiveness of our sin through his shed blood on the cross and hope for now and the future because of his resurrection from the dead. We have a clear and clean relationship with God, being fully known and fully forgiven, loved. He meets our deepest need and satisfies his deep desire to be with us. Our task is to believe, to accept his free gift, Christ, 
and to become more like Jesus. We have our whole lives to unwrap and discover how great his love is for us, experience deep peace and joy beyond understanding, and live in hope, the expectation that he will do everything he said he would do. Our deepest desire is that you will join us in celebrating and receiving the gift God gave, Christ, now, and with hope of eternal life as we meet him face to face when he returns. Jesus was and is and always will be the greatest gift. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Merry Christmas, Grace family. Oh, we came today, huh? All right, yeah. Oh, it's because you guys came to the 4 o'clock, so you're more awake. Got it. Got it. Well, welcome. Merry Christmas. Whether you have been here one time or a thousand times, we really believe that you are family. Uh, we don't do the idea of church that is just like you show up to a building and then you say, checklist, I went to church. That's not what church is. Church is us. Church is God's people. The word in the Greek is ecclesia, which literally means the gathering. So if you've defined church in the past as I went to a building on a certain day, you didn't go to church, you went to a building on a certain day. But if you are here to be with God's people, you know where you're at? Church. So welcome. Welcome to church. Ten of y'all are with me. I love it. I'll get you there. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. But what an amazing time of the year, Christmas. Christmas Eve, gosh, we are in this season, this beautiful season of celebrating the coming of our saviors. And today I wanna encourage you that we don't just gather with these people in this room at this time. We are actually gathering with, hear me out, billions of other people across the world. Billions of people celebrating the same person, the same savior, the same one who came and did what he did. And he did it for you. And he did it for you. So I pray that even in this moment, that kind of widens your scope of like you're not just at a Christmas Eve service. No, you are actually partaking in a worldwide celebration of God, the God, the only God, the one true God. Amen? Amen. That's what we're here to do this morning. So if you are here and you are new, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. If you are here and you are not new, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks for being a part of the amazing family that we have here up on the hill, up on this rock that God gave us. 
But if we say we're family, of course we have to act like it, you know what I mean? I am not a fan, nor will I ever be a part of a church that does the whole, like, I can walk in, just stare at a person talking to me, and then walk right back out and go home. That's not church, friends, all right? So I need you to turn to a neighbor, just really quick, really quick, give them a high five and tell them you love them. Come on. Just turn to a neighbor, give them a high five and tell them you love them, all right? Come on, just real quick. I said one person. You're doing too much now. Hey, okay, 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 really quick, turn to another neighbor, turn to another neighbor, give him a high five and say, I chose you second. Listen, I wasn't trying to start any Christmas Eve dinner fights, okay? But if your spouse was second, your priorities are out of order. God forbid I tell you to turn to another neighbor and say, I chose you third. <laughs> Hey, uh, if you didn't know, church can be fun, amen? Come on, somebody. Hey, I just want to ask a really cool question before we get into it tonight. I do believe I have a word from the Lord, uh, and I don't say that in like the corny, cheesy way. I, I genuinely believe God kind of breathed a word for tonight for us. Uh, but does anyone feel like 2023 just evaporated into thin air? Like 2023 just disappeared? Dude, I swear we had Easter yesterday. I'm being serious. I thought we did a service yesterday. I don't know how we're at Christmas Eve already. Summer felt like it was literally this morning. It's cold. It's cold outside if you didn't know. But what I want to do today is just kind of declare that we, we're here, whether or not the year went quick or slow or however we felt about it. Maybe it was a great year for you. Maybe it was a hard year for you. Maybe it was somewhere in the middle. I think all of us could probably say, like, both, right? There was good times. There was hard times. We're here. We're at this Christmas season, the celebration of our King. The Christ, like the Son of God, come as a child uh, to earth as an infant to live 33 years, to die on a cross, to raise back up from that grave, and to come back one day. And that's what we're here to celebrate. That's the gospel. That's the good news. If you go anywhere that tells you anything else, it's not the good news. That is the good news of our Savior. And today, what I want to do is I want to briefly talk about this celebration. What, what is Christmas? Like, why do we do it? Why do we, every year, why do billions of people celebrate this thing? And, and it's so interesting to me because I don't say this in any way condemning because I love Christmas. I love, like, every part of Christmas. And yet it's crazy to me that so many people celebrate Christmas without Christ when the word means more Christ. Christmas, Latin for more Christ. It's interesting to me. And yet so many of us celebrate it not even really understanding or truly celebrating what we're supposed to celebrate. And that's some of what we're going to talk about today. I'm not going to be guilty of this. So I want tonight to be a time for us to introspect a little bit on this Christmas Eve. As we go into the Christmas season and we go into dinners and, and gift givings and all the fun stuff and whatever you may do. I don't know what you do. Uh, you know, I don't need to or really want to for that matter because some of y'all, I mean, I'm, no, I'm playing. <laughs> not playing. Whatever you may do in these seasons... I want us to be people who look into God's word and look into the, the reason for the season and actually look in our own seat and say, why do I celebrate this? So let's talk about that. And before I pray for us, I'm going to give you the title of my message tonight. I do intend to preach for about two hours, so I hope that you don't have dinner plans. And if you do, cancel the Chili's reservation now, okay? Chili's isn't even good, all right? I'm so sorry if there's like a Chili's manager in here. <laughs> you do a great job. <laughs> Title of my message is this. Celebrate the beginning, anticipating the end. Celebrate the beginning, anticipating the end. If you would be willing, please pray with me. Father, I thank you for what this time of the year means that 2,000 some years ago, you actually, in, in your holiness and, and up in your kingdom, you chose to send your son as an infant child in a manger, a dirty sheep manure filled barn. And you did that for us. I thank you for sending Jesus. I thank you for your son and what he did for us. It is a, a gift that we can never pay back. So, Father, tonight as we get into your word and we talk about you and we celebrate you, I pray one simple thing. I ask that our hearts may be pierced in a new way that we might celebrate you differently this year. 
Father, I thank you for every single person in every single seat. No matter what season of life they're in, no matter how much of this they believe or, or, or don't believe or anything in the middle, I want you just to impart on them via your Holy Spirit right now. They've been prayed over individually whether or not they know it. So I thank you for every person in this room. I don't believe you do anything by accident because you're God. So Father, would you move how you would move this afternoon and would you lead us into a deeper love and celebration of your son Jesus, the ultimate gift? We love you. We trust you. And all God's people are going to show them how we do it. We sang, hey, man, come on now. Come on now. I'll call you out if you aren't singing. I saw a couple people I was about to call out, but I didn't recognize them. I don't want to freak them out too bad. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Celebrate the beginning, anticipating the end. Let's get into the word of God, shall we? I don't think I should talk anymore until we get into the word. We're going to be in Matthew 1 to start. Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. If you have your own Bibles, please open up to that. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. Half of y'all got kids in your laps, so I get it, okay? <clears throat> but I would encourage you, Google Matthew 1. It'll be on that page, all right? Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25, and it'll be up on the screens. It says this popular story, uh, one of the gospel accounts of the coming of Jesus. Many of us know these stories, but what I want to do is I want to dive into it tonight in a way that it's not just a story anymore. It's not just something we read once a year and say, okay, cool, I know Jesus did this. No, God's word can be life-changing, amen? How about this? God's word is life-changing, amen? So let's read it that way. It says this. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she found out to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph was her husband and faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Pause. Pause. I just want to highlight the faith that my, my boy Joseph had here, okay? Here's why I say this. Friends, if my wife came to me And said, I have news. Some of you think you know where I'm going with this? <laughs> and said that she was pregnant via the Holy Spirit. We would need some serious therapy. <laughs> and yet all jokes aside, that's what happened. And Joseph, clearly a man of faith, said, okay, I don't really get this, and we're going to get to it in a second, but, but I can't just leave her like that. I can't, I can't disgrace her like that. So let's keep reading. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. I want to pause one more time in this scripture. I think sometimes when we read especially popular passages, what we tend to do is just gloss over it like nothing's actually being said. Well, I know the story. I know why we're doing this. Let's just get to the gifts and stuff like that. Can I just pause this for a minute? The word Emmanuel, the name Emmanuel means God with us. I believe that we should be able to sit in this verse for weeks, months, and years, and it blow our mind every single time. Why? Because no other major religion or minor religion, for that matter, on the earth, planet Earth says that God came to be with you. All of them say he's up there, he's far away, you have to do stuff for him, you have to earn his love, you got to check off all these lists and be religious and then you're good. No, the Christian faith is the only one that says God is with you. I wonder, I wonder for myself first and then collectively us as a family, I wonder how many of us, our lives would look infinitely different, our faith would look infinitely different if we understood that God is not distant, he is near. God is not up there, he's down here. Friends, the Bible promises us, guess what? He's in this room. When two or more are gathered, he is present. Here's the question. It's never been if God is present. It's always been, are you looking? And I say that lovingly because there's tons of times that I'm just like, God, where are you at? Anybody relate to that? 
Anybody relate to man? Like, what are you doing? I'm dealing with this. I've seen this. There's hard stuff in my life. And yet I can tell you every time that, and I do probably say every time and mean it, that I've walked through something really hard that if I look for God, I see him and I grow. And yet if I walk through life never looking for God, I'll get to the end of my days and say, where was God? And he'll say, where were you? And here's the thing, I'm talking to me. I'm talking to me. I wonder how many areas of my life I've seen God move in amazing ways. I've seen people healed. I've seen monetary blessings come out of nowhere. I've seen people who were in the dumps of, of their life come back to life because of God's presence in their life. I've seen it over and over and over again. And yet I wonder how many times I don't live as if God is with me. And the question has never been, is he with me? The question is, Am I with him? Amen, Bo. That's my little bro right there. So it's amazing. He says, you're going to call him Emmanuel, God with us. Let's keep going. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took Mary home as, as his wife. So that's a step of faith. But he did not consummate the marriage, we're not going to get into that, until she gave birth to a son. And he gave him the name. Jesus. And that's when our Savior was born. And here we are 2,000 plus years later, guess what? Still celebrating the same thing. So again, my message title is Celebrate the Beginning, Anticipating the End. So what we see here, let's break it down just a little bit, is the story of the birth of Christ. And we see some of the drama, if you will, of Joseph and Mary. And like, you know what is cool about the Bible is when I read it, I just find the Bible characters so relatable. Why? They're all the worst. You know what I mean? Like, if, if you're like, well, Peter, and what about Andrew, and what about John, and what about James? Yeah, they were all the worst. That was the whole point. That's why I can look at them and be like, oh, my gosh, I get it. You doubted him. You fell in the water. You denied him. I do that every day. Judas even, gosh, if we're willing to go there. You traded God. You traded Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Guess what? I've sold him for worse. Some of y'all, some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about right now. We've sold Jesus for way cheaper, way cheaper. But we see this story, and, and it's amazing, and Mary Joseph, and let's just give them credit for their faith, right? Mary births the Savior of the world, and, and Joseph trusts God, and Mary, sir, and like, like, let's just pause really quick. Can you imagine being the father of Jesus? How many of you are dads in the room? Where are dads at? Or my moms? Any parents in the room? Okay, okay, imagine looking at your son and being like, hey, don't do that. And then he's like five, and he looks at you and goes, dad, I'm perfect. And you'd be like, I'm about to smack that perfect off your face. But then you just hit Jesus. You know, there's no winning. So Joseph, Joseph clearly had faith. Oh, my goodness. He, he was making incredible leaps and steps of faith. So we see this amazing story of, of God, the God, sending his only son to become human. And if it's true, friends, if it's true, it changes everything. And if you're in the room and you doubt that it's true, and I get it, I understand how Christmas and Easter work. I used to be the one that only came on Christmas and Easter because my mom would drag me by my ear to like literally to church. She'd have to promise me food afterwards just for me to show up. I almost asked for a show of hands. I don't want to know all y'all that are only here because your mom dragged you. You know what I'm saying? I don't even want to know. I don't even want to know. But I used to be that, right? And, and yet the reality is, if this wasn't true, Really intelligent people have had 2,050 years to try to disprove it. And guess what? Here we are. So it has to be true. Gosh, this immaculate, it's called the immaculate conception. This amazing thing had to have happened. Or someone would have figured out how to disprove it. Even modern day, we got these double PhD type of people who just think they're the best in the whole world and the smart, and they, they haven't disproved squat so friends, if it's true, it changes everything. And I think the reality is most of us, as I'm on my opening exposition here, are like, well, Phil, we know why we're here. We're here to celebrate Jesus. And some of you are like, Phil, I'm here to check a list and I need you to stop talking so I can go. The ones not laughing are the ones I'm talking about. <laughs> Again, I get it. I've been there. 
So we see this story, and we know why we're here, but I want to read one more scripture to guide our time, and I'm just going to hit us with three kind of quick ideas to contemplate. And, and when I say contemplate and introspect, I want you in your seat to do it. I really don't want you thinking about the person you brought with you that you're like, oh, please hear this message. I want you to think about you. But here's the second piece of scripture I want to read. It's out of Revelations 19. A couple of you were like, oh, boy, Phil, why? Okay, let's read it. This is John, the disciple. Uh, Jesus has died at this point, and John is on an island and gets a revelation from God, a prophetic word that he writes down, and he sees a lot of crazy things. And this is what it says in Revelation 19, uh, specifically verse 11 through 16. It says, I saw heaven, it's amazing, standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. This is referencing Christ. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. We're going to get to that. He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen. Just try to picture this, white and clean. I mean, they were, they were fresh, okay? Anything come from heaven, you know it looks good. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe, and it's crazy that we sang this song earlier because Jesse and I did not plan this. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. Say it with me. King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, this isn't your typical Christmas passage. Some of you were like, I did not show up for this. I showed up for baby Jesus, okay? <laughs> we're going to talk about that too. Not your typical passage. It's not what you get on an Etsy board to put in front of your kitchen. You know what I'm saying? Like if someone walked into your kitchen for a dinner party and they were like, swords coming out of his mouth and the robes dipped in blood. We're going home. <laughs> I don't want your asparagus and steak. I don't want it. Bring it back. It's not the normal uh, passage, I suppose, yet hear me out, friends. The same person being talked about in Matthew 1 is the same person being talked about in Revelation 19. Same exact person. Revelation 19 is an account of Jesus coming back in the second coming to take back what is his. So my premise and encouragement this evening is that for us, hear me, to truly celebrate Christ this Christmas or any Christmas for that matter. We need to be anticipating that that same child is coming back and he's not a child anymore. So my first point will come from a three little point outline, which is child, cross, and crown. Child, cross, and crown. My first point is this, the child. The child we're celebrating is not a child anymore and wasn't a child to begin with. I'm going to tell you why I think this is really important. The Christmas story is beautiful, and the Christmas story is, is insanely important. But here's the reality. The baby grew up. How weird would it be? You know, I feel like some of us are like, we come back every year and we're like, well, that's weird. Jesus is still a baby <laughs> in a manger. I don't know how you haven't aged in 2050 years. You look really young for being that old. The baby grew up. The baby became a man. The baby became a savior and the baby will come back. And while we probably think that that's, you know, uh, well, duh, Phil, I don't know. Because do we treat him that way? Amen, brother. Amen. You know, I don't know because I think, like, like, it's important for us to think that, like, on top of all this, the reality of this is that a baby never even was who Jesus was. Like, the, the little excerpt I read in the beginning, which is from Max Licato, he literally said, like, this baby has overseen the universe. This baby has overseen the universe, and he always has been, and he always will be. The baby is just a short part of the salvation story. So what this means for us is the great I am, like we sang earlier, the one who created heaven, the one who created earth, the one who made humans, a.k.a. also made you, whether or not you know it, like it, or believe it, the one who made you, parted seas, raised the dead, that baby is God. And sometimes, myself included, I think that we celebrate God as if he's a baby that never grew up. And we love the baby Jesus. Why? The baby Jesus is cute. The baby Jesus has no opinions. Oh, wait, hold on. 
How many of you got kids? Let's do this again. Let's do this again. You got kids? Hey, here, here's the thing. They are super cute until they start talking. <laughs> They're way cuter until they start having opinions. <laughs> they start telling you what they want for dinner. I have a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a six-month-old. And my five-year-old and my three-year-old are now talking, gabbing, doing all the things. And what I've noticed is that the cuteness leaves every time they tell me what they think about something. I'm like, be quiet. I didn't ask you. I don't say that. I do say that. But pause. I wonder how many of us treat Jesus like that. Oh, we like the cute version of Jesus, but the minute he has opinions about our life, we don't like him anymore. The minute he has a say about something that we're doing and says we shouldn't be doing it because he knows better, he wants better for us, he loves us, he's got better plans than our plans, all of a sudden we're like, wait a second, I don't like that Jesus. Can I tell you the reason I think so many people struggle to find Christ nowadays is because their opinions are too strong? We think we know best for ourselves, therefore we ignore anyone that could possibly speak into us. And yet God, if he is God, which I would argue factually he is God, he must know infinitely better than us, but the truth is, we like baby Jesus because baby Jesus doesn't talk. But the child we're celebrating isn't a child anymore. And he never was to begin with. I want to back this up if, you, if you're maybe like, you, you don't believe me or all you're doing is thinking about your dinner plans or whatever it's got to be. I love you. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, but I want to quote a famous theologian, Will Ferrell. Okay. I don't know why you're laughing. He's excellent. Um, and it's from a very doctrinal book uh, and movie called Talladega Nights, okay? Okay, here we go. I think this proves how much we love baby Jesus. And I quote in a prayer by Ricky Bobby. Dear Lord baby Jesus, we also thank you for my wife's father Chip. We hope that you can use your baby Jesus' powers to heal him and his horrible leg. It smells terrible and the dogs are always bothering with it. Dear infant tiny Jesus. And his wife interrupts him and says, hey, uh, you know, sweetie, Jesus did grow up. You don't always have to call him baby. It's a bit odd and off-putting to pray to a baby. And Ricky Bobby, the theologian, says, well, look, I like the Christmas Jesus best when I'm saying grace. When you say grace, you can say it to grown-up Jesus or teenage Jesus or bearded Jesus, whoever you want. And while that movie's hilarious, and I'm not trying to be irreverent, of course, or anything like that, I do think there's a sprinkling of truth here that we really like baby Jesus, and I don't know how much we like the grown-up Jesus. And while it's funny and that's good, I think we can be guilty of this. I think I can be guilty of this, like still treating Jesus like he's a baby. When in reality, that, that baby grew up as the son of God, died on a cross for you, thought about you, had to raise back up from the dead, which is incredible, and one day is coming back with a crown on his head. That's the truth. So I think what we do sometimes, and, and again, I can be guilty of this, is we like to enjoy the cute, cuddly version of Jesus because it's simpler, but we don't enjoy the king. And let me maybe just word it really simply for you. We like the cute, not the king. Oh, well, I like the idea of Christmas Jesus, but the blood dipped robes, sword coming out of mouth, eyes like fire, I don't know. Sounds like a sci-fi movie. It's the same person. And I'm going to challenge us today. Celebrating one without celebrating the other is to celebrate none at all. I'm going to say that again. Celebrating one without liking or agreeing with the other means you actually aren't celebrating any of them. And I wonder how many people in this world, billions of people celebrating Christmas tomorrow. And yet the Bible says what about the path to heaven? That it is a narrow road and many choose the big road. So just because we say we're celebrating Jesus, friends, doesn't mean we are. I did this for years. I loved Christmas growing up, but I was never really celebrating Jesus. So I encourage you to be taking that inventory. Do we just love the idea of baby Jesus while skipping this, the stuff that feels a little harder? And here's what I think this will do. I really, really, really believe that this will make our Christmas celebrations even more rich. 
Like if you actually dive into why you're celebrating and who you're celebrating, it'll make your season so much richer. You wanna know why amongst a million reasons? Because the stuff that doesn't really matter that we do every Christmas, which I love by the way, will be replaced by something that eternally matters. And again, his name is Jesus. So that's the first thing for us to contemplate this Christmas is that the baby's not a baby anymore. The baby becomes a king. So the second thing I'd like us to sit with, first with child, the second is cross. Cross. Don't celebrate the child without the cross. It's always interesting to me that, again, like I mentioned, so many people across the world only attend church on Easter and Christmas, and that's okay if that's you. There's zero shame or condemnation there at all. In fact, we're very happy you're here, and we're here every Sunday. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So come on. Come be with us. You know what I'm saying? But why do we attend these two, Christmas and Easter? a child and a cross. That's why we pick them, because they're two extremely important events. One is the son of God coming to earth who changed everything. And then is that same son of God who died for us and changed everything. So it makes sense that we celebrate these things. Uh, But I don't know about you because I love Christmas. I love traditions. I love the wonder. I love the gifts and the family, the joy. I love celebrating the birth of Christ. I really, really like super, super dumb Christmas games where you're embarrassing yourself, like with just tomfoolery. You know what I'm saying? Like you ever play that one where you have the uh, box on the back with all the balls in it and you're like dancing to try to get the balls out? I was just doing that last night. That's, That's fun. You know what I mean? I won every time. I'm just putting that out there. What, whatever you think that says about me, I'll let you judge me how you will. I love that stuff, and yet I wonder how many of us, myself so included, we love the Christmas season, but we don't really reflect on why we even celebrate it. That 33 years from the birth of Christ, he had to die brutally on a cross. And I don't know about you, but me and my wife have gotten in the habit on Christmas mornings of reading out of Isaiah, not out of Luke 2. Why? Because we want our kids to know he had to come for a reason. He didn't just come to be a cute baby for us to have an amazing holiday and get some days off. Anybody hallelujah, right? That's a good reason to celebrate. It's not the best reason to celebrate. And here's the truth, friends. I need you to hear this when we talk about this idea. Please don't celebrate the child without the cross. Is that the truth of the matter is we would never celebrate Christmas if there wasn't a cross. Without the cross, the child is just another child. Without the cross, Jesus is no different than you and me. And we are wasting our time here. I am getting sweaty on this hot stage for no reason. You're sitting staring at me for no reason. You dressed up for no reason. I still look pretty casual for no reason. (laughs) By the way, you don't need a suit to get to Jesus. Somebody needs to hear that. So let's not celebrate the child without the cross. But here's the thing. Without the cross, Jesus is just another baby. But friends, with the cross, the child is the most important baby to ever be born. That's what the difference is. And that's why we can't celebrate them separate. That's why we can't say, well, I love Christmas, but I don't really like getting to the nitty gritty of the cross and like, gosh, getting on my knees in front of Jesus because he died for me. Like, I wonder how many of you have just sobbed because you really realize he had to come and die for me. Everything I've ever done wrong, that's what he died for. Not for them, not for them, not for me. And friends, I didn't used to be this way, man. I didn't used to be a blubbery mess that just cries all the time and all sentimental and all weird. You know what I'm saying? I didn't used to be like that. But I'll tell you, man, I mean, at least a dozen, 24, 36 times a year out of nowhere, the truth that Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross and thought about me brings me to tears. It has to. How could it not? I would argue if it hasn't, we haven't really thought about it. I would argue if it hasn't, we haven't really realized it. Like we can celebrate Christmas all we want for our entire life. We can do that, and that's great. But if you go your whole life and never really are broken about why Jesus had to come, you weren't actually celebrating Christ. And I say that so lovingly because I did it for years. I did it for years. And by God's grace, now I know why I'm here. And I know many of you do too. But here's the reality. A lot of you don't. And I need you to hear something right now. I would rather bother you into heaven than make you feel good into hell. I would. I would. And and I speak to a lot of people. I do a lot of speaking engagements and things like that. And I've just gotten to the point where I'm frankly kind of unconcerned what people think about me and how I speak and what I say. Because in the end, one truth matters. So if we just get to odds about, well, I don't know about this, that, and the other, I'm like, dude, I'll either see you in heaven or I won't. I don't know. It's up to you. 
And the cross is where that line was drawn. And that's why Jesus had to come. So for us, it makes Christmas even better to celebrate that, oh my goodness, I'm celebrating like the child, Jesus, the Christ, but I'm celebrating him because he came and died for me. Not because he came in a manger and that's a cute story. That's not what you're celebrating. You're celebrating what he came to do and how he came to do it. And the Bible's clear about this. That baby is the same savior and the same champion to come back one day. Hebrews 13, 8 is super duper clear. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, if we like baby Jesus, tiny dear infant Jesus in a manger, in your golden fleece diapers, some of you understand the reference, but we don't like the one coming back down on a horse that kind of looks like a warrior, is a warrior, we're missing it. We're missing it. It's the same person. That's the same Jesus. And I think I can fall into the trap of loving the good news of Christmas, loving the season, loving the celebration. But listen, the rest of the year, I don't think about how that same baby had to brutally die on a cross for everything I've ever done wrong. And when we don't think about that, friends, we're missing pretty much the whole story. Pretty much the whole story. And I've done this. I've at times pick and chose what I like and don't like. Uh, I work with a ton of young people. We have probably 150 to 180 youth that come every Wednesday, probably 50 to 80 young adults that come every Tuesday. Uh, it's pretty thriving youth culture here. One of the most common things I see in the youth, and the more I look, I notice it in adults and myself as well, is that we are so worried about what we think that we completely miss what's actually true. And young people, maybe specifically because of the internet and the culture around them, uh, they just have a ton of opinions and they don't like the hard stuff that comes with Christianity because the world's telling them other stuff. But here's the thing, if you don't like the hard stuff, you don't like the cute stuff either. And that's just the truth. It's just the truth. I've been there. I've done it. So I encourage us this Christmas to take some personal inventory and just simply ask, do I celebrate Christmas? with full awareness that the child in the story was also an adult who had to die for everything that I've done wrong. And friends, that's for someone in the room that doesn't believe this at all, so glad you're here, to someone who's been following Christ for 50 years. That's for all of us to take that inventory. And that leads us to the third part of the celebration. We have the child, the cross, and now we have the crown. So my third thought for us, final thought for us to sit with this Christmas Eve is this. Celebrate the child and anticipate the crown. Brings it back to the title of the message. Celebrate the child and anticipate the crown. The wholeness of the Christmas story that the Son of God came as a child, he grew up, he died and rose, and is coming back one day to take his bride. Which, friends, when it says in Scripture that he's coming back to take his bride, what that means is the church. And what the church means is those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and have had the Holy Spirit come into them, and you see life change. The word says that you will know them by their fruit. If you ever have the question of do I know Jesus or not, which I hope a lot of us are asking that question, I ask myself that question. Look at the fruit. Is stuff changing in your life? Is God moving in your life? Are you seeing him and reacting? Are you saying yes to him? And the reason I want to highlight this is because if it's saying that he is the crown, like he's the crown wearer coming back one day as king, and he's coming to get his church, That means that if you aren't in him and you don't know him, that doesn't include you. And the heart of this church, Grace Fellowship Church, and many churches around, is that you do know that truth. Is that you do know that truth. Romans 10.9 makes it so easy. Believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. It's that easy. No other religion preaches that. Every other religion says you got to go do stuff. you got to work hard. you got to do the right amount of charity. If you sin just not enough, you'll be good. If you go to just enough church services, like if you make sure to hit it on Christmas and Easter your whole life, you'll be good. And God said, no, you could never do anything to earn heaven. Why? Heaven is perfect and you are not. Heaven is perfect and I am far from it. Therefore, we serve the only God, Emmanuel, who said, I know you can't do it. I'm going to come do it for you. We need this shift in mindset. Because if you think sitting in a church pew, or you think getting in your Bible once a week, or you think, I don't, whatever, is going to get you there, friend, I love you. It ain't going to do it because it can't do it. It can't do it. 
And again, I, I know Christmas Eve is the time to celebrate, and we are, gosh, we are celebrating, and we're going to light candles here soon, and it's beautiful, and yet it breaks my heart if someone were to walk out of this room not knowing Jesus. Oh, the son of God who came as a baby, who loves you so deeply. You're the whole reason he came. You're the reason he came. Do you know it? Have you experienced it? Is it truth for you? And it's the most worthy thing to celebrate in all of history. But I just think it's so important to reflect on because if we just say we believe this Jesus thing, and maybe it's because we were raised with it, maybe it's because we like the idea of it, or, or it's because it's just that time of year and that's what we do, or I had a traditional background so I know I'm supposed to go to church and, and all those different things, like whatever it may be for you, but we don't reflect on or understand why we celebrate, then friends, we're missing the entire point. We're missing the entire point, and I missed it for pushing 20 years of my life. I missed the point of this celebration. Celebration is a child named Jesus who came to save us from ourselves, and one day is coming to claim what is already his. So while we celebrate this child today and tomorrow, Let's celebrate while anticipating that that same child is coming back and he's not going to be a child anymore. He's going to look very different than the baby in the manger. And the really cool, amazing thing is it's the same person. That's our Savior. That's our God. That is our Jesus. So I want to encourage some of us, if not all of us today, that if we don't know him, friends, we can't anticipate his coming. We just can't. Again, I did this for 20 years. The Bible's really clear about this. It says that the truth is foolishness to those who are perishing. So the reason that the word of God and these, these concepts didn't make sense to me for so long, especially at younger years, is because I was actually perishing and I didn't know it. I didn't know Christ. I didn't have the life that he offers. I, I didn't have the Holy Spirit in me making me act like this. I promise you, friends, 10 years ago, this is not what you would have found Phil doing. I would have been leading like this in some dingy basement somewhere. I mean, some of y'all know what I'm saying. And yet, God, Jesus changes everything when we really get it. So, hey, if you're struggling and you're like, I don't, I don't really know if I feel this same way, Phil, that's okay. I can't do it for you, but he can. So my encouragement this morning is to give it to, or this afternoon is to give it to him, to trust him, to talk to him, to pray to him. Friends, God talks to you. Do you know that? God doesn't just talk to pastors. God talks to you. But I wonder how many of us try to talk to him. This book right here, it's an entire book written by God to you. And I feel like sometimes I'll be like, well, God, where are you at? And he's like, you haven't opened your Bible in a week. What are you talking about? I've been sitting on your shelf. So I don't know what it is for you, but I encourage you to lean in to trust him because this anticipation of the crown that Jesus, baby Jesus, grown up, will come back with changes our celebration completely, changes it completely. And that same child's going to come back, whether or not we like it, know it, or believe it. And he's going to take back what is his. And I pray today, we pray, you've been prayed over, that you're on that team that you know him, that you trust him, that you love him because he loves you. So child, cross, and crown. This Christmas, Grace family, let's celebrate the beginning, anticipating the end because it makes it all the more rich. So as tradition here at Grace, um, we're gonna enter a candle lighting service. So if you have your candles, please pull those out. Before I ask you to stand, I just want to read a couple things. In the same way that the candles were shortly about to light, represent how the child, Christ, was the light of the world. It also represents that when he left us and gave us the Holy Spirit, he said that we are now the light of the world. So when we talk about these things, like knowing Christ and, and pulling others in, we're talking about being the light that he was first to us and then going to be it for other people. Matthew 5, 14 says this, you are the light of the world, talking about you. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden and neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, 
Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Everybody may stand. I'll call the ushers forward. And in the same way that we, during Advent, lit our Christ candle tonight, it is only through the light of Christ that we can truly be the light of the world. So as you light your neighbor, I encourage you, the non-lit candle, to turn to the lit candle to avoid wax everywhere. Go ahead and pass it to your neighbor. And as you light candles, I encourage you to be contemplating and considering how, while this is symbolic, of course, that you can actually be this for other people. You can be the one that takes the light of Christ, the child born to us who went and died as our Savior, and actually spread it to other people. But during this time, we're going to sing a song called All Holy Night.
when Jesus came, it's as simple as this, the world was dark and he brought light. And I wanna ask a question, does the world seem dark today? And yet, the light is in this room. I would encourage you to raise your candles up. And go ahead and take a moment just to look around. In the same way that Christ was the light of the world, so we are called to go and be the light. And I just wanna encourage us one last time that if all of us left this room bearing the light and witness of Jesus, that child who became our savior and brought it everywhere we went, the world will look a lot more like this. And that's who we wanna be. So Jesus, we thank you that you are the light of the world. And because of your Holy Spirit in us, we can go be the light to other people. Father, would you help us do that? Because we don't know how, but you do. We love you and we thank you, gosh, in words that do not cover it for your son, Jesus, and what he did for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we extinguish, extinguish the light, we acknowledge that Christ's light will never be extinguished. Grace, family, we wish you the happiest, merriest Christmas. Uh, we do want to remind you that we do have New Year's Eve services next week. So if you are interested and you don't think we're too crazy, we would love to see you next week at 9 and 11 normal times. Other than that, please go enjoy your Christmases, be with family, and take the light of Christ anywhere you go. If you needed prayer, a hug, or a high five, we'll have some people up here that would love to do that. Go in peace. <laughs>